Hello, everybody. Um, so thank you for the kind introduction. My name's David. I'm in the Responsive Environments group here. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about what our group is about, um, some of the big projects in our group, and then a little bit about my personal work, which over the last couple of years is actually mostly fo focused on air quality. Um, so sensors are everywhere, right? They're in our thermostats now. They're in our refrigerators. They're in our blenders. They're everywhere. And in the very short period of time, they're all going to be talking the same language. And that opens up some very interesting and exciting possibilities. And that's sort of where our group starts. What does that ubiquitous computing sort of future look like? Right? So, so our group does kind of two, I would say, different things. One is actually try to create that future. So we build sensors, we build networks, we sort of think about how, how do we get there. And the other piece is once we're actually in that future where everything, uh, sensors are everywhere and they're talking uh, to each other seamlessly, what are the sorts of experiences we can build? What does that mean for the lived experience? What can we do sort of one, when, when we get there? Um, and it's coming soon, right? So I like to think of um, what our group does sort of in these three categories, actually core sensors, the networks that connect them, and then the sort of big experiences and how we sort of manage those networks and that data, right? So over on the left, uh, this is work uh, by Artem D uh, Dmitriev in, in my group. Um, and you can see some things that I would consider sort of like core sensors. So at the top is sensor tape. It's this printable tape that knows where it is in space and it knows when things are near it. Um, in the middle is, is sort of a fingernail sensor that you can control uh, different interfaces with your fingernail. And on the bottom is this new class of devices that he's working on called Rovables, which are actually these little robots that sort of run all over your clothes and talk to each other. And he's exploring all sorts of interesting applications with those, with those devices. So those are sort of like core sensors. Um, then we actually also build the networks that connect them. So we have our own semantic web protocol. So that's similar to, you know, right now we have the, the World Wide Web, which connects uh, uh, the internet, right, um, and web pages to each other. And in all likelihood, given the way the industry is going, uh, so this sort of hyperlink distributed structure is going to be the same structure you see connecting devices. And in our group, we actually have a a semantic web infrastructure that we use in all of our projects called Chain API. So we work on, on those sort of fundamental networks and protocols as well, um, and the core sensors that connect them. And then on top of that, we have these, these sort of big built experiences, um, and we explore all sorts of interesting things on top of that. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so I'm going to talk about sort of three, three of the biggest, longest running projects in the group really quickly before I get to my work on air quality. Um, so this is the first. This is called Mediated Atmospheres, and it started with a very simple question. Uh, so we have a room up in our space where there are all these really incredible uh, lighting systems, right? So uh, tons of lights all around the room. You can control their, their color temperature, their brightness, where they're focused, all these really interesting things. And the panel to use them is huge, and it's totally impossible to use, right? It's just tons of buttons, and no one would ever really be able to explore the entire space and, and intuitively understand how to use that system. So this project started just with the fundamental question, can we sort of create, take this really complex system and reduce it to a simple user-friendly interface? Um, and that was successful, and that has since evolved into this entire infrastructure. So up in the top left, you see Nan, who's the principal architect of this project. Um, and she is wearing Google Glasses. And the room actually tracks what sort of activity she's engaged in and where she's looking. And it reacts and, and sort of helps her focus and changes the lighting in the room depending on her activities. And over on the right here is Asaf, who actually went out and sampled different environments in the world. So he, he would go to gardens and libraries and actually uh, map out how the light bounces around those spaces, record video in the spaces, record ambisonic uh, uh, audio, and then bring that into the space. So now we can actually sample spaces and help you focus depending on, on those sorts of things. And then sort of lastly, an entire system has been built around this where we track your heart rate and your galvanic skin response and your eye movement and your facial expression and your, your breathing rate and all of these different things. And the, the entire room learns from you and adapts to you uh, in real time. Right? So, so fundamentally, we have this very complicated uh, control system of connected lights, all of these connected devices monitoring your state. And we're building this this really sort of involved intelligent system that connects all of these things into this really nice seamless experience. Um, 
that sort of leads us to our next project, which is called uh, a kind of a big project in a group called uh, Doppel Lab. And this uh, was a cover article in Scientific American a couple years ago, written by our, the PI Joe, um, if you're interested in finding out more. But at a high level, this is what it looks like. So this is actually a 3D rendering of the building that we're in right now. And the goal here is to display lots and lots and lots of information from lots of sensors throughout the building in a really intuitive way. Right, so this is connected to all of the HVAC system. It's connected to uh, the RFID reader, so you can opt in and it can see sort of how people flow throughout the building. It's connected to motion sensors and sound sensors, and it's connected to the ping pong table, and it's connected to all sorts of things all throughout the building. And this gives a really nice, glanceable, easy to use interface that you can look through time and see how people are using the space and how well the HVAC system is performing um, and, and all sorts of things just sort of at a quick glance in a very intuitive way. And an example of a project that sort of was built on top of this platform uh, is this wearable device that actually keeps track of your preferences for temperature and your preferences for um, lighting and all of those sorts of things, and combine that with some automated uh, machines to open windows and close vents and monitoring temperature outside and, and sort of through this Doppel Lab system, uh, they were able to uh, create this algorithmic intelligence system that would adapt the HVAC system to the individuals and predict as they're moving around what sorts of temperature profiles they should have in the building. And that only, not only led to a big increase in uh, favorability with the system in, in the building, but it also led to a huge drop in energy cost for the building. So this is an interesting sort of application built on top of that network. The biggest project in our group is sort of the natural extension of Doppel Lab into the natural world, and that's called Tidmarsh. So this is the largest wetland restoration project in Massachusetts. Um, and this is in, in Southern Mass. Uh, it used to be a cranberry bog owned by Ocean Spray, and it's now being reclaimed uh, to sort of a natural state. There's a huge team of ecologists working on this, uh, documentarians, all sorts of interesting people. And we've provided the sort of sensor network infrastructure to monitor the, the environment as it is reclaimed back to, it, to its natural state. So this is a picture of it. We've built, as I mentioned, sort of this entire uh, protocol backend uh, system to have the sensors talk to each other, we have a really talented electrical engineer in our group that's built all of the sensor nodes. So we have hundreds of sensor nodes out in this environment that look like this, that are monitoring things like temperature, humidity, soil moisture. Uh, we also have 32 microphones distributed throughout the entire space. Um, and here's some pictures of, of some of the sensors sort of out in the environment. Um, and all of that data feeds tons of projects in our group. So it's just this, this open platform to explore what do we do when we have all of this data in one space, right? So this is kind of the natural version of Doppel Lab where we, we uh, populate it with real-time sensor data. So the goal here is not to recreate a realistic version of the marsh, right? The goal here is to experiment with how to represent data in, intu in an intuitive way, right? So you can see the sensor nodes have their temperature data on top of them. They update automatically. And there's actually some, some ambient sound that uh, is, is driven by the temperature data. So you can actually start to hear sensor data. Right? So that's something we explore is like how, how, how can we represent data in new ways that's useful for people and sort of intuitive. And on that same track, we actually have a student in our group working on representing data as animals in Tidmarsh. So if you see some animals that maybe are furry, you know, maybe around that sensor it was cold. And are there interesting, sort of useful, intuitive ways to represent data in this way that people can sort of like glance and, and experience these spaces and, and uh, gain insight from? We also do uh, lots of AR, VR sort of work using this platform. So we have real-time streaming video of the site from a, um, from a drone. And there's actually a live video stream, that you can, video stream that you can look around in and overlay sensor data on top of. I mentioned that we have a bunch of microphones. So there's a student working on uh, deep learning for audio to try to automatically identify when there are birds, when there are crickets, uh, all sorts of interesting things from the audio. And one of, the, one of the really sort of fundamental projects in the group is this idea of actually augmenting your experience when you're in the marsh. So we have a wearable device that over, it's, uses bone conduction headphones. Um, and it, 
uses that microphone array to sort of to try and understand where you're looking in the space and how you're interacting in the space and augment your audio experience of the space. Um, so yeah, so we're we're exploring possibilities of how to how to change presence fundamentally when you're when you're exploring a space. So these are both really big projects um, that explore sort of a connected connected buildings and connected outdoor environments. Uh, the next project I'm going to show is is my work, which I've been working on for the last couple of years. I don't know if the sound uh, can be raised a little bit, but I'm going to just let a, a short little video play that summarizes uh, the work, and then I'll talk about it afterwards. Unfortunately, individuals living in polluted conditions have no way of knowing how much they're exposed to and what that means for their health. Learning how to solve the problem of personal sensing in a new way. When the Learner sensor detects it's near a high quality reference, it compares itself to that reference to see how well it's performing. At the same time, it looks for patterns and outside conditions that might explain each reading's success or failure. This allows the Learner sensor to estimate its accuracy at any moment by looking at the weather, the wind, and other contextual information, even when it's far away from a reference device. When it is near a reference, these accuracy estimates continue to improve. For our first test, we put six cheap sensors next to an EPA reference for two months to validate this approach. We then built a new type of database where measurements from multiple devices are automatically aggregated and used to train machine learning models that benefit each individual device. Finally, we prototyped a portable solution to leverage this infrastructure. Learning our points to future sensor ecosystems where variable type and quality of sensor seamlessly work together to ensure data integrity. All right. So that was a pretty quick overview of the last two years of my life. Uh, and uh, the basic idea behind that is that consumer air quality devices are at a really unique state right now. Um, the physics of the devices are getting better. You can get sub $100 devices that are actually capable of sensing pretty sophisticated tolerances. But a lot of the consumer space is really crowded with devices that just don't work if you put them in real world situations. Um, and if you look at any of the sort of like EPA standard co-location studies, all of these cheap devices are untrustworthy. Um, so there, there's sort of a crisis in, that, in the research communities about how to interact with these consumer devices, knowing that um, uh, knowing that the future is sort of dependent on them. And, and so there's a lot of research that's been done in order to improve the accuracy of these devices, but we're taking a fundamentally different approach, which is let's just sort of accept that given the current state of things, they are not going to be totally accurate. How can we characterize their accuracy and make that data useful as best we can? Um, so I am happy to talk more uh, about this, and I think we will be talking hopefully at length about th uh, these sorts of approaches. Um, I'll be sticking around. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. And I, I really just glossed over a few major projects. So if you're interested in lots of other projects that our group has to offer, our website uh, has all of them uh, displayed quite nicely. So thank you.